we see in this case the inside of the left foot and this is also the inside of a left foot but attached to the right leg. The legs portrayed sideways, the chest face on, the arms extended, the face sideways, and the eye drawn as if you looked at it face on, showing the most information. What I'm going to do here is to show you this detail. This detail in the red square to show you how much detail was actually connected with this tree, which seems a very small part of this illustration. But just to refresh your memory, here is the important person buried here, scenes of his life being acted out. Here are less important people, some people in society who were simply workers, drawn much smaller. And these temple guards, drawn larger than these workers, but much smaller than the ruler who's buried here. So let's take a look with a close-up in this area here. This is closer up, and I've drawn here the square in the same location in the tree. So this is a bird that you'll see in greater detail in the next slide. And here is that bird. And what you see now are these tiny little leaves being drawn in a great amount of detail in sort of a greenish pigment. Lighter green because greens were still very hard to create but all this detail connected with these birds so today we can still tell the species of the bird and identify them very readily by the coloration and the amount of detail and here's an even closer picture showing the extreme amount of detail where every one of these leaves was colored and drawn independently even though in its entirety that's such a tiny amount of detail here that probably standing in front of it it would look like a blur but the detail was important to preserve the information that was essential for the preservation of an environment for the ruler's afterlife. Here's another illustration, this one uh, on papyrus, which is a, a reed, a reedy plant separated and strips of it laid crosswise to each other and then pounded together the naturally occurring uh, gums and uh, sap joining it together into a thick sort of a paper. And here we see drawn on here with various kinds of pigments having been probably mixed with water and maybe a little substance like gum arabic which is a sugar so it produces some adhesive quality and tends to make pigments mixed with water better. You see a number of different colors here. Greens, blue, yellow. The green might have been made by mixing the blue and the yellow the same as we might mix paints you see hieroglyphics here drawn with a sort of ink. And the scene said to be from something called the Book of the Dead. It was more likely an Egyptian understanding to be a book called Going Forth by Day. It was a series of spells and incantations and various other prayers to ensure and to guide the afterlife of the deceased ruler. Now we come to an interesting thing here. There was a brief period of time in Egypt around this this period of time, 1300 BC or so, where this rigid form of art that we see here with the kind of representation of the maximum amount of information and rather stiff poses was relaxed. There was a ruler named Akhenaten who attempted to do away with the whole catalog of Egyptian gods and replace that just simply with a monotheistic sun god usually represented with a sun disk and these rays with little hands at the ends of the rays. And I think the reason for this is that it was almost as if when you step out into the sun, you, this feeling you feel on your cheeks is kind of like a caress. And it's almost like these hands would represent little caresses on your face, the effect of the sun on your face. This artwork scandalized most of the conservative Egyptian community because it represented things that broke those rules of art. Uh, there was still some tendency here to represent the chest face on, the head sideways, the eye face on, but notice here with these feet. The feet are being drawn more as you would see them with little toes and part of the back foot here, the right leg being uh, covered up by this leg and of course you see the the normal positioning there. But another thing, look at the size of the rulers. This is the ruler, the pharaoh, and this is the queen. Now she's the same size, perhaps even a little taller. But the position here is very relaxed. 
a, a flagrant violation of the the way that art was intended to be according to the conventions of the society. Here's another illustration of that. Uh, this one is uh, King Tut, who died as a very young ruler before he was 20 years old. This is gold to which some types of pigments have been applied here, some type of a paint, or perhaps fused on by applying heat so that this, this compound would join to the metal. Very pretty, very brilliant kind of artwork. But you'll notice in this case, uh, King Tut was the son of uh, Akhenaten, and the same conventions of the sun god, these little hands here, and violating the conventions that had been established. Here the size of these people is about the same. The ruler, the pharaoh, is shown in a rather undignified position, just sort of calm and laid back, if you will. And once again, violating the conditions here of showing the most information. This was not popular, and when King Tut died, very quickly art reverted to this form that you see here. And it stayed that way for thousands of years to follow. So the people who created this type of art were not regarded as artists expressing something that they had to say in this emotional way. They were tradesmen. They were craftsmen. And if you had the skill to replicate art as it had been done for years, then this was the job you were given. If you couldn't do that, then you were given some other job. Now, another thing the Egyptians did was to experiment with pottery and glazing it. What happens here with pottery is it's a, it's a process where clay is formed, it's soft, and it's molded into a shape and let to dry. But that doesn't make it very hard. It's fired to perhaps 900 or 1,000 degrees, and it becomes hard. Then a type of a compound, water-based compound with some uh, chemical additives to it, is applied to the surface of the fired pottery, and it's fired again. And that second firing changes the chemical nature of this coating so that it takes on a color that it may not have had at all before it was fired. The Egyptians also used other materials. Here's precious stones, stones of different colors. So here you see one type of a stone, here another one that gives a blue color, here's a greenish color, and all inset in gold. Various rules applied to which colors could be used next to one another. And if the colors were used in inappropriate ways, then they lost whatever significance they had in representing, in this case, this scarab beetle. Now, in the same era in the Middle East, there were other civilizations. The Sumerians and the Babylonians, the Assyrians, they had a purpose for this type of art that was a little different than the Egyptians. This is carved into a stone surface, once again where the stone surface here has been carved away to leave these things sticking out from the surface. This is kind of a newsreel of propaganda. What's happening here is a depiction of a victory. This is representing somebody who's leading the troops. The troops are climbing up to some place where they've attacked, and these are the victims. These are the people who are being conquered. Now, what was the purpose of creating a monument such as this? Well, first of all, it told a story. It told the story of the victory of these people over these. Another thing might have been that by depicting it this way, the victors telling posterity about their victory, they might have been attempting to ensure that victory or preserve it. That by having depicted this having happened, it not only remains in memory, but it will remain in fact that these people will remain subjugated. Art for the purpose of documentation, for informing, or perhaps for perpetuating a situation. And here's another example in the very same way. These are probably Assyrians, and they're attacking some place where you see here the people who are being besieged falling off of these, these ramparts. Here's another one falling down. Interesting thing about this is the victors are entirely victorious. You don't see any of them suffering wounds having been inflicted by the defenders. Instead, it is a form of propaganda. It shows the victory is very complete. The victors have vanquished the foe, and perhaps once again this would be a way to ensure that continued situation, having commemorated it this way to a permanent medium.